I'll be introducing the speakers to the uh, presentations and then letting them introduce and uh, make any comments about their co-authors. The next presentation is going to be presented by Miguel Jose Yacaman, who's been one of the leading scientists in Mexico for decades. He's been an advisor to the government and he's advised many graduate students. In fact, he was responsible for us getting one of our best graduate students here at Lehigh, Jose Santos Stephen, who will be here tomorrow. And uh, we, we appreciate Jose uh, Santos Stephen coming to Lehigh and uh, successful science, scientist now in the United States. So uh, Miguel will tell us about theoretical and experimental studies of active sites in the platinum gamma alumina catalysts. Well, first, I would like to uh, mention that it's uh, <coughs> a real honor for, for me to be in this important moment, Camille, because he has been a, a great friend for many years, and, uh, and I met him first at the ACS symposium in Las Vegas in 80 or 82. And he made comments about the world that were very you know, important in the developing of the techniques that we did. So thank you very much, Camila, and you again. An honor to be your friend for this so many years. Now, as Rick said, I, I think uh, we have to acknowledge the group, and this is the people that are working with me in the catalysis of the part of the University of Mexico and part of the Nuclear Institute of Mexico, where I am now director. Another is very bright, <coughs> John guys that uh, are forming the group. Now, what I want to talk today is what I've been working for 25 years is nanoparticles. And as uh, uh, you well know, nanoparticles, they contain very few atoms. So they don't really uh, can be considered molecules. They, but also, they cannot be considered a, 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 a bulk. So they are between, between them. Now, uh, Boudart maybe made you find a very interesting distinction. He classified the nanoparticles in uh, three groups. Uh, he said particles uh, above 50 amsons. Then they exposed complete crystal phases with distribution independent of sizes. Then he talked about uh, metal particles between 10 and 15 amsons. And then they changed the particle size and changed in catalytic activity. And then he, he spoke about particles of less than 10 amps. I think, uh, uh, and then those are the clusters that Gabor was talking about. I guess in modern times, and in the modern language, what Udar was saying is that uh, there were quantum size effects present in this category, and also in this one. And in this category, there were not quantum size effects. So he was talking really about the transition between quantum and non-quantum behavior. And I think this is now very clear and in the nanotechnology field, which is one of the hot fields, and of course for catalysis is going to be very important. And when we go to the microscopic, to the microscopic, we will hit this region in which we have these colloidal systems, uh, which can be characterized by uh, a size, which in this case goes to about 10 amsons, and what is called the Kubo uh, 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 energy gap, which is uh, the distance between occupied and occupied states. And then you can go from the mesoscopic to the microscopic. And this will be the, the one, one category of the Goudard clusters, and, and this will be the other one. And really what is happening, is that as you divide metals, and you make it smaller, then the quantum effects start to show up. And then for the microscopic pictures in which you have the Fermi level and the occupied states and so on in the metal, then you, you reach this, this state in which you have a metallic cluster, and this state in which you have an insulating cluster, and then an atom or, or an molecule. And I think what we have learned in the last few years is that the in this state, 
the clusters really uh, behave more like uh, molecules than, than, the, than the bulk solid. And then you can control the conductivity of the cluster and also, you know, the electrode properties, just changing the size and controlling the size. Okay, that's Now, uh, electron microscopy has been a tremendously important uh, uh, technique to study uh, this, this range of clusters. And I, I want to say that now electron microscopy will be focused to really study these things. Uh, and there has been many, many improvements. I, I just want to mention some of the techniques which are going to make a tremendous impact in catalysis in the next few years. And I think I've all mentioned some of them. But when you look at the microscope, a transmission electron microscope, there has been improvements in almost every part of the microscope. Now the electron sources we have them with better temporal spatial coherence. We have better lens uh, systems, which are very low, uh, 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 is very current. Uh, what's called CC is a uh, 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 spherical uh, chromatic aberration. This is wrongly written here. Then we have better ways to prepare samples. And then we have a breakthrough in the possibility of having objective lenses with no aberration. And then finally, we have much better detectors. Okay. So let me just uh, mention that uh, right now, nowadays, it's a routine work that you determine one, one point in your sample, either by bright field or dark field. And then you, you can make, uh, uh, you can select another point in a different region. And then routinely, you can get the microanalysis done from that region. Like for instance, in this case, we have platinum supported in alumina, and then the size of the object that we analyzed was uh, 10 axles in both cases. But that, that can be done now in an almost routine way uh, with the modern microscopes. Uh, <coughs> also, you can do mapping, and that's another interesting thing. Like in this case, uh, we have a metal cluster, which is platinum ruthenium supported on silica, and then you can make the map of the, of the platinum, you make the map of the ruthenium, the silica, and the oxy oxygen, and then you can figure out uh, where, where each part of the particle is located. But now the next, the next step in electron microscopy is coming out from uh, energy loss analysis, electron energy loss analysis. This is making a tremendous impact, I guess, in catalysis, and, and I was just seeing the beginning. By doing energy loss, we can go the whole spectrum from the valence uh, losses, and then we, we study the valence states on the optical properties, to the high losses, to the core losses, and then we can study the bonding, the oxidation states, and the concentration. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, in the case of the X-rays and the synchrotron, with the synchrotron radiation, the x axis and the harness uh, have made a tremendous impact on the field of catalysis. I think a lot has been learned about the surface uh, uh, in this way. Now, you can do exactly the same with electrons in techniques which are called illness and excels which are just looking at the structure near the absorption edge, exactly the same with an X-ray. And you can get exactly the same information that you get in the X-rays. With one difference, you have a brighter source, much brighter source, and you have a special resolution. A special resolution. So you really, what, what you are getting is at the end, an electron probe diameter which might be probably four amps and then you are getting information about the bonding and the chemical uh, oxidation and so on in these in this areas. Every four amps or so you can get, you get this. So basically, what you are going to get is especially resolved information on local band structures, or you, you are getting. Now let me just show you an example of this application. We have been studying uh, uh, 
self-assembly of gold particles uh, covered with a thio molecule, you know, thio to have to passivate the molecule. This is the gold, the regular bright field. And then using eels, we can uh, pick up the sulfur, the sulfur pit. And then this is the map of the sulfur at a little higher magnification. So what you can see is how the sulfur is really covering the surface as you expect because you form a bond between the sulfur and the gold, as we have to expect in this kind of system. But, but then you can map where, where the light elements are, are located. And that's really the, the, the power of eels. Now, the other technique which is making a very important impact is uh, what is called uh, high uh, angle, angular dark field detector. What you are doing is you are forming a dark field image with taking the electrons which are scattering by large angles. And that means that you are t taking the total incoherent part of the signal. So uh, all the, the, the dark field here is still has the coherence due to dynamical diffraction. In this region, it's totally incoherent. So that means that the signal that you are looking is just proportional to the atomic number, simply proportional to the atomic number. So that means that uh, uh, if you have a, a bright field image, then, then uh, upon the dark field image, you can resolve features which are directly related to atomic number. Uh, for instance, in this case, uh, this is platinum in alumina, and uh, we're resolving here, I'm sorry about the quality of the, the production, but all of those platinum clusters, very small ones, about five thousands in diameter. And then, let me just show you another example in, uh, Uh, some clusters of four axles in diameter that were sold in this way. I'm sorry about the quality of this reproduction, it's not very good. And even more, since the intensity is proportional to the C, uh, to the atomic number, you can do a profiling of the intensity, and the profiling of the intensity will tell you about the shape of the particle. Because it's directly proportional, like in this one, for instance, you do a scan. And then you get the profile of these different particles. Uh, and even more since now, uh, computers are hooked to the electron microscope. You can do the same for a large number of particles. So if you take a catalyst, and let me just say, an example just came from the, from the uh, oven, really fresh from the oven. We took a analysis of about 200 catalysts, uh, 200 particles in a platinum and aluminum catalyst. So from each one, you can calculate the exact size, and then count them, and then make a distribution. And right from the computer, in a matter of about uh, 20 minutes, you can get the size distribution from the catalyst. Uh, that used to take, uh, you know, uh, months to do that, to take the pictures and to measure, measure all that. Now this can be done immediately in this in, in this. Uh, and I just to mention that uh, with this technique, C contrast, uh, you can really decide whether the particle is three-dimensional or is a raft. Because this, in, this intensity, like in this case, you will have a, a very flat portion so this will indicate you that your particle tends to be more flat in this case. Okay. Just take this one. Uh, just another example in this, these two particles, platinum again, uh, this two, seven, and eight, uh, the intensity profile will, you know, also will show a very kind of flat region because there's a lot of so, so this particle will tend to be flat. I just want to spend a word on the flatness of the particles. And really, the term raft was introduced into the catastrophe literature about 20 years ago. 
Unfortunately, this term is not uh, totally scientific. I think it uh, doesn't describe any scientifically explicit uh, structure. It gives the impression that you're talking about something which just dispersed. And I think uh, uh, by doing a little bit of molecular simulation, uh, and this was done using quantum mechanics, and part of the group is doing these calculations, is that uh, you have the alumina, which is the orange, and then the, the raft of the platinum, which is the, the vibrant, okay, like in this case, and then you have a standard raft with no real structure, no real crystal structure. When you minimize the sample, the, the energy, when you minimize the energy, then the platinum atoms go all over the place. So the cluster is not really a cluster, but you know, the atoms sort of uh, uh, remain uh, kind of uh, dispersed. However, if you put a kind of a FCC raft, which means something which is growing with a crystallographic group, like in this case an FCC, and then you do the same, you, you do energy minimization, then this will be stable. The raft uh, then will remain stable, and then that means that that the rafts are probably most be uh, correctly described as FCC islands, which are tend to be flat. And by the way, also the clusters do the same thing. You can do the same for a cluster. For instance, the cathedral cluster like this one, they, they are also stable. They are also stable, so it's, uh, uh, and then they can be there. Now, what I, I want to mention is now high resolution, just present a few results in high resolution. And uh, high resolution electron microscopy has been complicated because of the dynamical scattering, because you are projecting in two dimensions the specimen, and because of the lens aberration. There has been efforts to resolve all these three problems, particularly the last one now, uh, Microscopes with no spherical aberration has been constructed, so the aberration has been minimized tremendously. And then we have very well developed theory that can really help us to understand the dynamical scattering. And, uh, and of course, in each, in each case now, images have to be taken from the microscope and then processed through an algorithm that you decide to reduce the noise and to improve the signal. And also, every experimental image has to go through a model, a simulated diffraction pattern, and then a simulated image to get the recognition of the image. So you, you have to do both, image processing and uh, image model. Now, uh, uh, let me just show a few examples of this. Uh, this is a catalyst. Platinum, this is the, the Euro catalyst, the Euro PT catalyst, and we got samples from, uh, from uh, Strasbourg, I believe, seven years ago. So this is platinum in alumina. This is the Fourier transform. This is the high resolution image. In this case, each uh, bright spot is a, a color of atoms. And then in the Fourier transform, you have several components, and you filter them out. Okay. Now, one of them corresponds to the alumina, and this is just what you expect. Another one, the B, corresponds to the platinum, and this is the image that you see, just the platinum. But there is another peak that uh, gives you information with those. It's not localized on the platinum. It's just partly localized on the platinum and partly localized in the alumina. Uh, and this peak really, what it means, uh, well, I, I don't want to go into the test, but that means that there is a reaction in the interface that you can detect through, through, through this method. Now, uh, just to quickly conclude, I would like to show you some of the very first pictures that were obtained from clusters in a microscope that was corrected from the spherical average. And then this is the first time I'm going to show these pictures in a, in a public meeting. Uh, there is only one microscope actually working in the world. It's in Germany, in the Ulich. 
and we have been lucky enough to use it several times to produce uh, studies of particles. Now these microscopes are for their construction, and maybe in two years will be commercially available. And really, what the, one of the main advantages is that the, the image is localized where the real atom is. So one of the problems in high resolution, the standard high resolution, is that the image is not corresponding to the position of the atoms. In this microscope, the, the delocalization is called is almost zero. So you really can get a, a good information on there. And, and then uh, you do some simulations, and then you know that there are conditions in which you can really uh, see the atoms in almost three dimensions. Because if you have, for instance, a, a homotahedral particle in one zero zero orientation, you can see atoms at different levels being shown at different colors. Okay. Okay. I think I, I have no time. But let me just show you the first result. Uh, Professor Gawarso Moya was talking about this, uh, the flexibility of the clusters. Okay. Uh, this is an experimental image of a particle, which is a decathedral particle, one, which is fluctuating uh, all the time. And uh, what it's really doing is moving around. Uh, before, before these experiments, people wrongly interpreted this like a change of the structure. This indicates that this particle is not changing the structure. What it's doing is just moving and arranging, but within the same orientation. Okay? So when, in a molecular dynamics picture, what it's doing is really interacting with the substrate, and the particle is moving okay, because of the interaction with the substrate. And you can see also in these pictures the carbon atoms move. Okay? So this is one example. Uh, the other one uh, is that now we can study in a very detailed way the clusters interact, how the clusters fall a compatible story structure. This is a, and uh, we'll finish in a minute. Uh, and this is a picture of probably the smallest cluster that has been ever a picture, uh, taken a photograph. It's a palladium cluster, which is only 10 ounces in size. And you can see the very well-defined crystalline structure. You see the six spots here in the, this is in the two two orientation. And also we see in the palladium icosahedral structures, also very small icosahedral structures. Uh, these and these correspond to icosahedral structures. And uh, finally, uh, we're able to see, in the case of the platinum, a cluster that, uh, uh, let me take this increase a little bit positive. A cluster of six atoms, which is here, and then the, the Fourier signal of, uh, of the image, you can see the six spots. So it's really a true image, not the, And this is probably what we would call a raft, which is an order array, but only one monolayer of, of, of platinum atoms. And uh, just, just to end up in the future, which is being now developed, is a new type of microscope which the resolution will be uh, sub -answer. Okay. And then it will have a monochromator to reduce the story of the chromatic aberration, uh, a filter to, fil to analyze the energy and to do use, uh, and also a, a corrected uh, uh, spherical aberration lenses in the objective lens, and then a very high quality uh, detectors. So in the future, we are going to see much more for an electron microscope. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll have another presentation and then we'll have a very